thank you very much, Kevin, for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank the LMS for inviting me to uh, talk today. So uh, my talk is part of research that is funded by the PSRC, uh, one of the research council. It's a five-year program related to the mathematical modeling of the brain. And I want to tell you about some aspect that we've been working on. And you see this beautiful picture. It's part art, part medical imaging from Greg Dunn and Brian Edwards in uh, the US. You see already a lot of things. This is what is called a sagittal slide. So if I cut the skull right in two and I look inside, this is what I see, so like that. And what you see is quite interesting already. Uh, you have the outer layer is really packed with cell body. This is the cortex with the gray matter. There is a lot of activity there, a lot of cells interacting with each other. And then you have this long filament, very elegant. These are the connection to T cell, the part of the cell, but extremely long. Some go from the top of your head, like the one on top of the parietal lobe here. Very long axon going down the brain stem all the way down to your leg. You have the occipital lobe back here, where all visual information is processed. You have the huge frontal lobe in the front of the brain. That's what makes us human. We process a lot of feeling, socialize, empathy, all that is being processed there. There is a lot of structure. We have the cerebellum here, little, the little brain, part of proprioception, motor control, and all that. There are different areas that does different things. But I want first to bring you to a time where you assume, and let's assume we don't have that kind of information. All you have back in the, let's say, 200 years ago, you have a few good questions. People realized that the brain was important. One of the key questions that was both scientific, philosophical, but also political, is if I have a brain, can I actually distinguish from the brain different traits of character? And the way they put it at the time was, can I distinguish the insane, the criminal, and the genius? And they said, this is like the three fundamental colors and if you blend them, you have a normal person. <laughs> okay. Another question, that's one of the questions I'm going to uh, talk about today. Another question at the time is what distinguishes the human brain from the animal brain? What makes us so special? And I want you to start thinking about it. Suppose we don't have all the medical beautiful things that I just told you, we don't have that knowledge. All we have is Bob on the left here and Ellen on the right. So Ellen, is a genius. I know her. I know her very well. She's remarkable by you. Bob is a little slow. Okay. If I just look at their brain, is there any way I can get that? How would you start if you don't know anything about neuroscience? These were the question at the time. No, the question have evolved, but not that much. These are still the fundamental, some of the fundamental questions that we ask ourselves about the brain. What is the relation between structure and function? If I see something on a scan, others that relate to the capacity of somebody to understand, maybe some disability that I can diagnose. What is the relation between the brain as a biological object and the mind as a construct, what we use to interact with the world? And the other question is equally important, comparative anatomy. What's the difference in architecture in the brain of animal? What are evolution create a different type of the brain? Can we understand something about our own brain by looking at other brains? And to tell this story, I will use a mathematician. I thought that was good for a mathematical lecture. This is a, a drawing of Carl Friedrich Gauss, probably one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. We know all his mathematical achievements, and I'll tell you about some of it. But you probably don't know that his own brain played also a role in the discovery of brain function. So let me with, start with chapter one. The story will be in four chapters. And I'm going to ask Carl Friedrich, how big is your brain? This is the first thing you probably say if I ask you, how can I say if somebody's better than other ones? You'll say, oh, he has a big brain. You know, it's part of popular culture. Big brain is probably better than a small brain. Is that true? How do we do that? So let me take you back a sad time, 1855, February 33rd, 23rd. You see it's written here. That's the day the world lost Carl Friedrich Gauss of a heart attack, age 78. 
at that time, Gauss was so famous. He was a living legend. He was a child prodigy, a servant at court. He created new fields, not only of mathematics, but new fields of science. He was already known by his peers as the principi of mathematics. Look at his medal that was, uh, that, that, that was created by the king of Hanover right after his death. You, I don't know if you can read. It says Mathematicorum Principi. Principi sometimes is translated and we, by prince. As Gauss is the prince of mathematics. Prince are not particularly known for their mathematical abilities these days. So Principi, part of the Latin, is more like foremost or the leader. And that was a title that was not given by the king, but given by his peers. Nobody has been given that title since then. The other one was earlier before him, one, one century before. He was the last leader of mathematics. He was a genius that would make any other genius feel inadequate. So, the time of his death, five people cut down and made an autopsy. One of them, in Göttingen, had the good idea to start an entire research program just based on his brain. The idea was very simple. I'm going to keep Gauss's brain, and I'm going to compare to other people. Since he's a genius, we'll see what are the traits that is going to appear. Okay, his doctor was Richard Wagner. He started a program of collecting brain, including his own after he died, and so on, at Göttingen. And there's still a collection to this day in Göttingen of a brain. And it wasn't isolated. People did the same in the UK. In France, there was the Society of Mutual Autopsy, they call it, where people would sign up and donate their brain to science. In the US and so on, large collection of brain. So what about Gauss's brain? Well, this is it. Beautiful drawing by Wagner in 1861. So what can we say about Gauss's brain? Well, as I say, you have to compare to other brain. Right? You have to start collecting. So I did my homework, and I went and collected not brain, don't, don't worry, but just data about brain. And I found an article in 1978 of somebody who collected the autopsy report of 20,000 brains and selected 2,000 brains of men that were uh, kind of standard. And this is a distribution of the brain. The average weight is about 1,400 grams. This is, would be typically Bob here. Or maybe not, I don't know. This is about 1,400 grams. This is for men, women a little smaller. So if you put your hands together, this is about your brain. Go ahead, do it. This is, this is your brain. It's about the right side. You feel like you have a big skull, but actually, put your hands together, that's your brain. It's really not that big, right? It's really kind. A lot of things is going on in that very small volume. So. 1,400 grams, standard deviation of 240. What does that mean? So this curve is the bell curve, this famous bell curve. It was developed in around 1840, about the same time, by something somebody called Adolf Kettler. It was the first to show that the distribution of the population in Belgium would, uh, of height would fall on this curve. It's also called the normal distribution. But in mathematics, we call it the Gaussian because Gauss was the first one to describe the distribution of error and found that curve as a result. So this is the Gaussian curve. So the part in pink there is about uh, 240 grams apart. 68% of the population would fall in that. So if we have 200 people, or let's say 100 men here, 68 of them would probably statistically more or less in that range of weight of, 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 uh, of, uh, of brain. And here, you'll have 95% and then 99.5, the Gaussian. So, first question, and premiere in the world, just for you, where does Gauss fall in, on, on his own function? This is Gauss on the Gaussian. 1492, not bad, is the 80% percentile. You would expect more for a genius, of course, to be, if, if bigger was much better, if it was the only reason, uh, it's not bad, but let's see. Here is the brain of Dirichlet, who died a few years later in 1859, the father of analytical number theory, also in Göttingen, colleague of, of Gauss. A little bit better. But let's look here. This is more related to where we are. Babbage, 
1871, known to be the father of computer, the idea of computer with Ada Lovelace. You see half of his brain because half of his brain is at the uh, Ontarian the College of Surgery, somewhere in London, on display, and the other half is at the British Museum. So <laughs> you have to put the two together. So we still believe in scientific relics, you know. We still go and pay homage to them. Right in the middle, very average brain, despite the great man. Here is Helmholtz, the really like the German Maxwell, extremely important physicist, one of the, one of the developer of, of multivariable calculus, very important. Ah, so they're all, they're not doing so well, but you could say they're on the right side of the curve, right? Ah, but so, here is an idiot, <laughs> and I, I don't mean that out of disrespect for the, the, the brain of that person. This was the clinical term in 1866 for somebody who had mental age around four. You had idiot, imbecile, a little better, morons after that, age 10, 12. This was the clinical description of people. Some of these terms are still used in the US in, in legal text, actually. So, yeah, so that's not too convincing an argument that better is bigger. Uh, bigger is better. But now let's look at this one. What is the genius of the 20th century? Einstein. Where does Einstein fall? There's a whole story of Einstein's brain. I'm not going to even start. But where does he fall? Oh. <laughs> 1,230 gram. Not exactly the giant of uh, brain power there. So, but let's go a little bit further. And let's look at the very big brain, uh, pathology associated with big brain. And this is an imbecile, very large. You know, so. so clearly, we have to do something else. This is not very good. And it was fully understood by Darwin already in 1871 when he wrote The Descent of Man. He says, no one supposed that the intellect of any two men can be accurately gauged by the cubic content of their skulls. Very clear. Right? You can maybe do something at the level of population, but don't try to do it at the individual. That, 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 would be, that would be stupid. So let's look a little bit at the second question. Can we make the similar statement between our brain and animal brain? So this is a human brain. It's not bad. It looks very big on the screen. But this is an African elephant brain, five kilogram, much bigger. Right? So what's going on? Are you going to say, aha, wait a second. Elephants are much bigger, and you have to take that into a question, uh, to, to take that into account, right? You have to scale some more to make sure that you know things are proportional. Okay, so if we do that, <laughs> I take an average elephant and an average man. Here you see that indeed the brain, the branch is much smaller, right? Proportionally, and that was one of the first law of scaling, trying to understand the relation between size and weight that was proposed in the history of science that by Halbrecht von Haller in, Swi in uh, Switzerland in the 18th century. And he refers to that example about the relation between the elephant and, and the man. And for instance, there's a good reason why the feet of the elephant have been proportionally much wider to sustain the pressure than the feet of men of, or, or, and so on. We notice scaling. So how do we scale things? How do we do it for the brain? So if, for instance, I try to plot on a graph the weight of the brain as my y variable versus the weight. And I, have, I, see, I see the data falls like that. You learn in school that you can fit a, a, a line in there, right? The method that you actually use is called the least square method. You try to minimize the distance between the line and the, the data point. It's a method that was invented by, not this, not Bob, but Gauss, actually. It's one of his discoveries. So if you do that, you can actually find A and B, right? You can find the loads. Right? There's a very elegant method to do that, a little algorithm which runs very easily in no time. The problem is often the data does not follow on a, on a, on a line. Typically, data like that, and you see right away, just looking at it, you don't have to do stats. This is not a good fit for the data. What you really like is to do maybe a curve, right? A parabola, a cubic, or something like that. But the problem is you really don't know what the exponent is. And you cannot directly apply the method. The math gets very, very messy very quickly. But here is a very neat trick. If I take the logarithm of both sides, and y is positive, and then automatically 
I have log y equals log of b times x to the a. And if you remember that log of a times b equals log of a plus log of b, this expression you can simplify as log of y equals a log x plus a log b. So in terms of this new variable, log y and log x, this is again linear. And this is the same problem as the first one. So if I plot the log of the data on both axes, if it follows a law like that, the data would, would, would go on a line. Poof, very easy. I don't have to do anything. I just have to first take the log and apply the previous method. And the idea is that I have plenty of points for animals that fall around here. We know that humans are vastly superior if they're somewhere above that. You can say there is a strong difference in the way we scale with respect to, uh, to animal. It's, for instance, true for age, the number of beads, and things like that. It's true that we are exceptionally different from animals. What about the brain? Well, that's the data. You see you have a lot of animals here, and we are right at the red dot there again. The scaling is quite good. The exponent is somewhere between two thirds and three quarters. There are different theory, different speculation for that. I'm not going to go into that. It's quite well established. But if anything comes out is that there's really nothing exceptional there. We just, just like the dolphin or something like that in terms of relation. So again, nothing comes quite clear about what is exceptional about the brain just in terms of relation between a weight or, or, or the brain or, or with respect to other animals. And indeed, again, let's turn to the wisdom of Charles Darwin and his beautiful writing. He said, it is cert certain that there may be extraordinary mental activity with an extremely small absolute mass of nervous matter. Under this point of view, the brain of an ant is one of the most marvelous atoms of matter in the world, perhaps more so than the brain of a man. He says, you know, it doesn't matter. It's what's inside that counts. OK, good. So. Maybe a little bit disappointed. Different doctors say, OK, you realize in this table, Richard Wagner, that the ghost was not particularly great. The French had the same kind of discussion about Cuvier, the famous biologist. And they argue about the weight of, of his brain, trying to get his hat to make sure to look at the hat. Same for Napoleon, actually. They had a whole discussion about what would his brain would have been, and so on. A lot of discussion like that. But then they say, OK, maybe that doesn't work. The, 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 the science doesn't support anything directly related to the brain. But maybe there are the features. Now I look at the brain, and look at his brain. And Richard Wagner writes, is, the cerebrum, the brain, is remarkable for the great complexity of the convolution, or its shape, its intricate shape. Right? And he was not the only one. You have a lot of description of this guy. This is especially for the LMS. Down the road in Russell Square, you'll find the Morgan House, one of the great logicians of the, of, of the 19th century, right? the seat of the uh, LMS. And I couldn't find, I know what happened to uh, the Morgan's brain, but I couldn't find a drawing of it. But the description is the convolution of the frontal lobe are voluminous, but by no means so intricate as in that of Gauss. I'm sorry for the LMS and the British mathematician. It seems Gauss has better convolution. <laughs> Another one, Kowaleskaya, my favorite mathematician, who died tragically at the age 41, around 1894. Description of a brain, the brain was developed in the highest degree and was rich in convolution. And it's not just mathematician. Of Beethoven, it is said the convolution appears twice as numerous as in ordinary brain. Of Mendeleev, the chemist, we have a description from the Russian school that the brain has a luxurious presentation of convolution. So of course, this is a bit of nonsense. If, if you don't know what to say about the brain, just say it's highly convoluted, and you'll find something nice to say. You know, like you're given a baby or something like that, and you have to say something nice about it. And you say, well, the baby has really nice eyes. You know, it's not so he says, here is the brain of Lenin, a great genius. What can you tell? Oh, he has very nice convolution, indeed. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be in problem, a big problem with the, the Politburo. Anyway, uh, so of course, at the individual level, this is nonsense. You cannot look at individual character. You really have to think in terms of population. And you think that his idea would have gone through. But look at this description of Einstein's brain in 2012. These surface of Einstein's brain are unusually convoluted. So this idea is still floating. So if you look at a mathematical problem, how do we 
try to make a sense, a quantitative sense of this idea. Well, if you look at the brain, you have to go back to the basic of the brain. And you know, not a sagittal slide, but a coronal slice, cutting the brain of Bob like this, like that. This is what you'd see. And what you see are the cortex outside, made of gray matter, and inside, white matter. So this, all this connection I show you. And this convolution with sulcus and gyrus, which is the name of the valley and the, and, and the mount. This occurs, you not, you not, doesn't start with that, you start in utero, as the baby grows in, in, uh, at five months, at six months, the brain is completely smooth. And then you have a transition where the brain starts folding, and start folding more and more up to uh, birth. So that's an interesting problem, right? How does it happen? How can we quantify that? Here is better direct data from MRI, where you see that somewhere between weeks 27, 28 in gestation, the T convolutions start appearing. How does that happen? Right? Then we can try to quantify. One of the, what, what is clear is that the surface area all of a sudden increase much faster than the volume. If you had just a sphere expanding, its volume would go much faster than the surface. But the, the surface is managed to increase despite the volume not increasing much. So you have to make a lot of fold and all that. And the idea, of course, in terms of function, is quite clear, is that a lot of very high cognitive process take place in this layer of cortex. And if you want to design a system that has this, this function, you want to be able to pack as many as you can in a, in a finite scale, in a finite volume. One way to quantify that is to look at the so-called Gaussian curvature of the brain, which is a measure of how tightly uh, things are. If you have zero Gaussian curvature, the yellow part, this is the flat part, and you have positive and, and negative one. It's one of the measures that's used, but, one, uh, but there are other ones. So how do you get this picture? Well, in order to get this picture, these are typically done in MRI. There's very nice technology. So first you need to put uh, somebody in the MRI, and in this case it's Ellen. So you see here is my collaborator, Ellen Kuhl in Stanford, and this was done when I was in Stanford. And then the machine goes, and there is actually extremely interesting new mathematics done over the last 10, 15 years that made this process much faster than before. A lot of big revolution in kind of data, handling, compressed sensing, and all that. But that's for another story. So you go, you hear a lot of noise, bzz, 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 you take a lot of picture, so the typical MRI is about one Tesla, and one Tesla is about one, one to two Tesla. Two Tesla, one Tesla is what? Is 10,000 Gauss, the same Gauss. This is the unit of magnetism. This is still a friend Gauss looking over our shoulder. So you have all this picture, and then what do you do? Well, you have to transfer black and white picture, pixel, into real three-dimensional object. This is the part called segmentation. And once you have that, you have a full representation of the brain. It's just it's very nice. And that's Ellen here and a brain. Right, this is with a 3D printer in my office. So once you have that, once you have slice of the brain, what you can look at is called the gyrification index. Concept is very simple. You look at a line on top, and you look at the line that you would have if you follow the, conv the convolution, and you look at the ratio between the two. In this case, you see if you have convolution, it's 1.47. If you don't have flat, it would be 1. Okay? So you can do that on every slice. You can average and all that. You can do that for uh, primates. This is a beautiful slide from a paper from uh, Katia Oyer and Roberto Toro in, uh, in Paris. And then you can put all the data together. What does it look like? Well, if you look at the log of the gyration index, again, the log of the weight, aha! You see the dot? We write up there. We're much better, obviously, than all the other guys. And if you zoom there, yes, we have chimp, obviously not as good. We way up there. We won, right? That's it. We found that there's something special about us. But that's until you get more data and then you realize <laughs> that all these pesky dolphins are actually much better than us of this kind of thing. 
So maybe, I don't know, maybe that's why you look at a picture of dolphin, it's always smiling. Maybe it's smiling at us looking down. But by the end, we eat the dolphins, they don't eat us. So what's, what's really the connection here? So you can go a lot with that. It doesn't really help that much. I want to ask another question. When I see this beautiful brain, I want to go back to the shaping process. How do these convolutions appear? So there's been a lot of different ideas that have been proposed, and I'll show you why mathematics is particularly good in order to select this one. One of the ideas about 100 years ago is that as the brain would push again the skull, it wouldn't be able to keep going and be forced to fall down. But in 1950, Barron at Yale did a series of experiments on sheep and that's, for instance, a drawing of sheep number 409. No kidding. Imagine that. So he would go and manipulate the skull of sheep of, of the embryo while it was growing inside the sheep and see what the result was. In particular, he would remove completely the skull. And what he observed is that the brain was the same as before. The convolution had nothing to do with the skull. And actually, now we know that the skull is really respond to the, the brain and not vice versa. It's the brain that shaped the skull and not the opposite. So that's not why this convolution appeared. Another idea that was actually proposed by applied mathematician about 30 years, 40 years ago, is that the outer layer grow much faster than the inner layer. The cortex expands much more, much quickly, and then is forced to bend back, just like an ins mechanical instability. So let's try to understand that a little bit better. If I take a slice here, let's take a two-dimensional slice, it's easier to think about, we can make an ideal model of just that slice. We have the white matter below and the cortex. And we're going to assume the white matter basically doesn't grow. And the cortex, that upper layer, grow quickly. So the question is, how much does it have to grow before it's forced to fall back, right, in, in order to get and what we want to know is what is the critical value of growth, how much does it have to grow, but also what is the wavelength, and can we compare that to real brain? Once you formulate the equation, an exact equation, this is what you obtain. Um, so this is a set of two nonlinear partial differential equations of the fourth order. Now, there is a lot of technique and all that. If you like cars and you build, you know, if you're an engineer building cars, you, you're passionate about the engine and you can talk about it forever. I'd be happy to go into details. But the purpose of a car is to get somewhere. So I'm going to close the hood, not look at his equation, and see where we're going with that. What can we learn from that? Okay, there are methods to do that. There are techniques. There are things you have to learn. And it's a real delight when you know about these things. But the message today is not that. We have this equation, and we can extract information about that. We want, that's what we do, right? And what is the information, and how does that relate to the brain? So forget about this. I'll give you the snapshot of the result. The result is fascinating, because it's actually extremely simple. The number of oscillations, so how tightly packed it is, is directly proportional to the square root of how much growth you have, and inversely proportional to the thickness of that layer of the cortex. So what does it mean? Well, the relations are quite simple. It means that as it grows, it's going to fold, and that you'll have more wrinkles if you have more growth. You have more wrinkles with thinner cortex, because it's 1 over h, and you have less wrinkle with thicker cortex. Okay, so you learn something from that process. That's a prediction. Can we go back now to the brain and see what happens? The interesting case at the pathology, let's look at the first case where we have more wrinkles for more growth. A typical case is the difference between a healthy brain and a schizophrenic brain. In the healthy case of the schizophrenic brain, you have much more growth and indeed a much higher wrinkling, more convolution. Okay, that's the first case. Another pathology which is interesting, very sad, very grave, is called polymicrogyria, where you have a thin cortex. And what you see is a very tightly convoluted pattern here. So having more, more convoluted pattern does not really help you. This is a very serious condition, a genetic condition. And the other case, where it gets bigger, it's also bad. This is called lysencephaly, smooth brain. If the cortex is too, too thick, 
is not going to be able to fold and perform the function that it has. The two extremes are not bad. You must have some kind of balance. So going back to our brain, now we understand a little bit how this shape occurs and what they're for. They are there to pack this lobe, this localization of function with parts that are mostly used for language, mostly used for visual, uh, uh, visual processing, and so on. It forms this, this region where you have localized activity. So we started with the 19th century, the view of the weight and all this. The 20th century is more understanding this convolution. Now the 21st century, the theory shifted again, and we try to say, OK, we understand that, but what about this connection? The brain is connecting and talking to each other. How can we get that into account? How can we understand that? So this is a chapter three. How connected are you? So since 94, is essentially the last 20 years, you can even get more information from the brain than the MRI that I, that I showed you. You can also get a very precise map of all the axonal bundle, this filament in, in, inside the skull. Full description in there, right? This is a different view. This is done with Johannes Weick and Meyer. He's not Stephen Institute. This is his brain. This is his face, if you add all the layers. <laughs> so what do we do with that information? We have mass information, mass of data like that. How do you understand how, how the brain is connected? So what you're going to do, let's do something very simple. We're going to identify big region in the brain. And there are atlas for that that tells you, oh, this is called the frontal lobe, this is called the cortex T, blah, blah, blah. Let's take 83 of them. So you're going to make little patch, little patch, and you're going to count the connection that goes from one to the other one. And you do that all over the brain. In the simplest case, the simplest reduced model are 83 of these. And so what you get? You look at the connection. Now you count the connection, how many fibers. If they're not enough, you don't count them. And then you get a full brain in 3D with all its connection. And that's what it looks like. So you get now a network of the brain that represents the connection that exists in your brain. OK, so what do we do with that? We have a network, a type of graph. Now we can do some math, some good math. So from that, what we're going to do is a very simple exercise in linear algebra. You don't have to know anything about linear algebra. It's just counting. Let's label the nodes, these points. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's see. Just take six of them. And suppose they are connected like that in my little example, right? Like this graph. So one is connected to five and two and so on. And I, I can get all that information in one single table. And this is the table. It's called an adjacency matrix, but we don't really care about what it's called. And the first row, it says that number one is connected to two and five. So I put one in, row, in column two and five. Get that? So let's say by then, number six is only connected to four. So let me go. So this is the sixth row. And I go one, two, three, four. I put a one there. Right? Number four is connected to three and six. Uh, three, uh, number four is connected to three, five, and six. Aha, there is a mistake in my matrix. No, it's here. Number four is connected to one, two, three. Yes, four, five, and six. Okay. So now all the information about the graph is contained in that matrix. Good. This is the brain. This is 83 by 83, a dot if there is a connection, and no dot if there is an, any connection. We can do a little better, and we can do this is the black and white version. This is the color version, much nicer. And that's weighted by the number of fiber and the distance, so you have a little bit more information. And the picture is much nicer, too. So you see that, and you say, well, so what? It's a beautiful pattern. There is a lot of information. How do, how do we get that information, something about the brain, from that picture? What is the first thing that you see from that picture? There's something obvious. Yeah, it's like two butterflies, two hives. The right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, right? This is the first. Already, you have that pattern already appearing from the data. You learn something. And indeed, the right hemisphere and the, uh, the left hemisphere only talk to the corpus callosum in between them. There's not that many connections. OK, so that's interesting. But let's get some real math behind it. So let me tell you a little bit about network. What you can do. One of the simplest things you can do is to look at 
add number. You want to give one number for the entire network. And this is the average minimal length, which gives the, on average, how long does it, or does it take to go from two random nodes? If I pick two random nodes, what is the distance that I have if I count one every time I have to stop to one node? And what you do is you look for and understand the distance between one and five, they're connected, so that's one. Distance between one and four is two. Between one and six is one, two, three, that's the shortest path I can find and so on. So I do that for all of them and I average them for all of them. In that case, it's quite simple, it's five third. That's the average length between two random nodes. Right? So that gives you a, already an idea of things that are connected. Another one is the clustering coefficient. And the clustering coefficient is the relative number of connected triangles. What does that mean? Suppose that I know Bob and I know Ellen. What is the probability that Bob and Ellen know each other? I just see. And if they know each other, we're kind of very connected, the three of us. Right? So you can see these are the same ideas that are used by Facebook and Google and all that. They do all this clustering to analyze the data, friends of friends and so on. These are all the same idea, but let's see how it applies to the brain. So you look at all the pair, for instance, there are five nodes that are connected at least to two, but only one that has two friends. So if I'm one and Bob is uh, five and uh, Ellen is two, if they know each other, we have one triangle and the other ones don't know each other, okay? So it's an idea of how tight of do your friends know each other, essentially. And if they know, you know they're forming like a little click together, right? It makes you feel. So it's a way to, to, uh, to do the clustering. In this case, there are five nodes connected to two nodes, but only one triangle. So the clustering coefficient is one over five. So it's a measure of things. So ideally in a brain, you'd like the communication between two points to be very short and the clustering to be very short. But that's not possible because you have to realize that spatially. So about 20 years ago, there was a big revolution in the world of network that created an entire new field. It's one of the most important topics now in data science. And that was done by uh, Duncan Wantz and my fr friend Steve Strogatz in Cornell. And he says, well, let's look at very simple graph. Here is a graph that's completely regular where all the nodes are connected to the neighbors and the next door neighbor. So you're connected everywhere, extremely regular. Well, if I want to go from the left over here to the right, it's gonna take me a while. I have to jump by two, but still I have to jump. So very long path length, but very high clustering because every node that I close, are close to each other, right? So on the other hand, I could have a completely random network I have very short path length because I find a random way to go from A to B, but I have very low clustering, and I have a, very, a lot of long connection. So his idea was, I'm going to start removing some of the connection of the regular network and connect them to the long distance. And as soon as you do that, very quickly, you get a short path length and a high clustering. So this is the idea be behind the six degree of separation. If you know people that know people and all that, they are, you only need six friends to go from A to B, small world network. So that idea was quite a revolutionary for network in general, started a new field, but it went much farther than that. A little bit later, the Danny Bassett and Ed Bulmore, Danny Bassett is Pennsylvania, Ed Bulmore in Cambridge, they realized that this structure also applies to the brain. That was yet another revolution, a revolution in neuroscience, very quiet. But since then, for the last 13 or so years, everybody in the field of neuroscience, or a lot of people, use network ID in order to understand function. And what you see here is the same network I show you, I just put them in a circle plot. And what you see is very tight connection with a few random connections. This is the same graph that I showed you before. I just reorganized the node between left hemisphere and right hemisphere, and I co colored them by them. That changed, complete game changer. The realization that the brain is uh, a, a small world network. Now you can see that on this picture, the brain along the diagonal is very red, you see the red along the diagonal, that means high clustering. And then you see long connection here, this is the corpus callosum, this long connection between the right and the left that connects, and then also long connection there, right? So if, 
If you give them a little bit more time, you actually see this structure appearing. Now there is yet another interesting measure for the brain. It's called the Rich Club structure that was developed by Van den Heuvel and Spawn in 2011. If I take a graph like that, and I look at the red nodes, I see that all the red nodes are highly connected. But not only they're highly connected, they're also connected to each other. So that's what's called a former rich club. Think about rich people, they know a lot of people, but we know that all the rich people also know each other, right? So they create a certain level of integration of the entire information that can trickle for everywhere. That's why they call it rich club. It turns out that the brain has this rich club structure that naturally come out of the data, and the network they identify are the known network of control of the brain. And here is an example with the cat connectome, where you see that it is in red the highly connected network, and they're connected to each other, a rich club structure. And now we start understanding a little bit better what's going on with the brain, you have this tight little local clustering that process information, and then you have regulation zone that exchange the information, this rich club network that allows the efficient transfer of information between different local structures, little cluster. And it's very, very smart design, very good. So here, this is the function that's made by the basal ganglia that's inside the brain. It takes the information from the different part of the brain and resends it in a different direction. It controls the flow of information. It's a very efficient design, but it has its flow. And what has its flow is that not only information can flow on the, on the graph. So let me go for my last chapter now and see how all this Carl Friedrich, 78, he died. So the brain ages. How does it age? How does it grow? This is a set of data. This is what happens, but <laughs> oh, this has happened when you stay too long on, on, on TV. Yeah. Uh, the brain shrinks, but typically not by that much. So here's the evolution of the brain. Between birth and about 10 years, uh, 20, age 20, the brain grow, men in blue, uh, women in red, grow by about 300%. Quite expansion all the way to your 20s. <coughs> So if you're a teenager, your brain is still growing. That's why there are so many change and all that. Then between age 20 to about 45, it's mostly constant. There's no, almost no change. And then from then on, you have a drop about 11, 15%. A drop is not as bad as you think. There are only about 2 or 3% loss of neuron of what you actually use for processing information. Right? But it's quite significant already. And, and uh, Carl Friedrich, in 78, was probably doing much better if you only compare his cohort of old people. But anyway, we decided it's not a good measure of anything. It's interesting as a whole, a trend. It's not very well understood at the neuroscience level what really happens in the shrinking process, but let's take it as a, as a given. But what's more fascinating is what happens in pathology. And there's a very important pathology, a set neurodegenerative disease, where the shrinking takes place much faster and you have a lot of loss of neuron. This is a normal brain of the same age compared to an Alzheimer's disease patient. And what you see is this walnut effect, this shrinking of the brain, this shriveling, you lose a lot of mass very quickly, within five to six years. This is a devastating disease that starts in the 60s, that probably a lot of, a lot of you know people that are, that, that are confronted to that one way or the other. There is no cure, no treatment. It's something that happened very quickly, within five to 10 years, you have a complete loss of brain, not a complete loss of brain matter, but lo complete loss of functionality. So we decided to look at this problem, Ellen and I, for the last two or three years, and we developed a model to try to understand what is the transport, what happened in the brain during this event, during this disease. And we, with the help of a biologist, we look at uh, an idea that has been proposed only in the last six years or so, where the responsible factor, the invasion in the brain, is due to a pro protein, protein disease that transmits all through the brain. There's special protein in the brain, special molecule, very different than other diseases like uh, viral disease, bacterial disease, cancer, completely different. It is a very small molecule that 
propagate to the brain and turn healthy version of the same molecule into an unhealthy one, toxic one, that attacks and kills the cell. It's a very good idea. So the idea is the following. Toxic protein diffuse along this preferential path and convert healthy protein into toxic one. And once you reach a certain level of concentration, damage happens and atrophy takes place. So the model that we built, I'm not certainly going to sh not show it to you today. It's quite a big model. Conceptually, it's not that hard. But the model is a model of transport and creation of new protein. And then you couple that to a model of atrophy to see what happens. I'm going to, again, not show you what the engine is. I'm going to show you where the car is taking us. And this is the kind of model when we run on Johannes' brain or Ellen's brain. This is the kind of thing that we see. So blue is low level of toxic protein, and red is complete invasion. And so what this model tells you is how the disease spreads through the brain. And we can compare that to what is known about the disease. People have over 20 years or 30 years of dedicated experiment look at slice of dead uh, brain and look at how this protein go from one stage to the other one. And there's very, very clear staging. It's a very homogeneous disease that a very clear evolution through the brain. So we have the clinical data, and we can compare that to the model. And when we run the model, we obtain exactly the same pattern. We completely, we think we completely understand the evolution of the disease through the brain, how it's spread from one point to the next one. And you can do it not only for one specific disease, you can do it for series of disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS disease, and so on. So we have a good understanding of that. And then you can couple that to the shrinking process. You can actually take MRI of people years 0, 1, 2, and 3, and then compare that, take, extract that, start from 0, extract that from the model, look at the evolution of the concentration, and run the model. And this is what the shrinking we, we predict in the process. The color is not the protein itself, it's just the force developing the things. It says, OK, this is interesting. We can, we can understand a lot of the mechanism on this. But what is the mathematical reason of that process systematically taking place in the same way? And then we thought, well, how does information flow along the axon? This toxic protein also flow along the axon. This is all we know from a lot of biologists they are transmitted along the system. So how does the process take place on the network rather than a continuum model? Can we further simplify and try to extract that? So we have now to think about how information is transported on a graph. And you, the idea is to start with this matrix, and you create another matrix, which is called the graph Laplacian. So the way you create it is very easy. In the diagonal, you see 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3. I just count the number of 1 in each row in each column. So I have two ones. Now I'm going to put a 2 there. Do we agree with that? If I have 3, 1 on the second, I'll put a 3 in my diagonal there. And whenever I have a 1, I have a minus 1. I put a minus 1. Okay. That's a game we can all play. But this object is a fundamental object in the theory of network. It has a name, the graph Laplacian, because it's associated to the Laplacian. It's a discrete version of diffusion process for heat or, or protein or concentration and all that that we use in other systems. It tells you how things flow on a, on a graph. So if I have my graph like that and I start heating it or I start looking at protein or ink going from one place to the other place, I would be able, extracting information from this, from, the, from this matrix, very simply, with very simple tool, I would be able to tell you what would be the end heat distribution everywhere. And people use that for various reasons. For instance, if you want to know if a graph is connected, you can run that, because heat wouldn't go from two places that are not connected, so you can find subgraph of a graph, for instance. It's very powerful against the kind of technique that are used by the big guys, you know, the, all the people doing data, Apple, Facebook, Google. This is one of the many tricks that plays a fundamental role, but also in science related to beautiful mathematics. But for us, it's important because now we can run, based on this transport ID, we can run our neurodegenerative model on the graph. 
It's not just diffusion because it's also reaction. So it's a non-linear process, but it's much more than that. But the basic transport is controlled by the graph Laplacian. And so you start, red is bad again, blue is low and all that. And you see the evolution, the propagation through the graph. What do you learn from that? No, we have we can reproduce a lot of the phenomena that we see, but we can also do fundamental mathematics on this model, and we can extract very precise information about it. And what we found very recently is that we can prove that the primary infection in this disease is directly connected to the, 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 the connected node. So what happens in the disease is that it actually starts in the entorhinal cortex that is around that purple dot, and in the primary step, it only affects the connected nodes, properly weighted and all that. And that's, a, that's a property you can prove. So you go from the limbic region to the basal ganglia to the temporal lobe, and then you have a secondary infection that goes to the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And this is something that you can see in here, well, I'll give you all the detail, the blue one against a low region, this is the last part being infected. You can show that this is systematic, and that's a property that's extracted out of the connectome of, of the system. And we know that the disease primarily affects memory, because memory is, or the, is mostly located in the hippocampus, and that's part of the basal ganglia, and then the temporal lobe. So you can understand directly from the topological structure of this graph, the way the disease progress and how it affects people. So let me conclude. Let me review a little bit about what we learned. I put a lot of material out for you, trying to give you a sense of the kind of idea. So we saw that the study of brain naturally developed idea of allometry. That was the first idea. It's this idea that a used all over biology, comparative biology, the idea of scaling laws. They're very powerful ideas. That mechanics explain the basic morphogenesis and the convolution that you observe. And these are ideas that have only been developed over the last five to 10 years by our group and a few other ones. Now we have a good understanding and we can really relate to observation. We can connect to data and all that. There's plenty of beautiful things that we can explain through these models. That brain network is fundamental for understanding of the function, and that the basic way of brain architecture function is probably different than from other from animals. We're not quite sure. It's this idea that you have segregation of function that you have plays in the brain that do a lot of computation and integration with different region. The integration done by that central region, that rich club, that relay information. So you have a lot of processing and exchange of information. Both, you need both to be, to, to be efficient. That the neurodegenerative disease, despite the immense complexity as a disease and for treatment, are actually quite simple, surprisingly simple, that with the basic connectome, just numbers, integer numbers, you can actually predict trends and things that you see in the disease, there is a simplicity there that you can capture from the mathematics. And you don't, you, you don't need just topology, you want to go further, you do need kinetics and mechanics to have this shrinking and all that. So what we see now, the way we understand, or the way we study the brain, is that the brain is multi-physics and multi-scale. Multi-physics, it depends on multiple theory of physics transfer of electrical information, fluid, solid, connection, and so on, function, flow of information. Multiscale, because the event that takes place in the millisecond that affect life on the overall years later. But also things that happen at the nanomillimeter that affect things at the whole brain level. You have to integrate all the scales. So it does require multi-mathematics. And so it's a perfect playground for applied mathematics that try to pick up the mathematics that you need from different pieces in order to get you a full picture. And I like this picture of Robert Flood, a Kabbalist from the uh, 16th century, the late 16th century. He has this idea that the brain is divided in different micro-world, microcosmos. 
And the way I see the laws, think of the brain like an isolated different microcosmos, like an onion peel, and each peel is connected to another one. But maybe if you understand each one separately and how they interact, maybe eventually we'll learn something about the brain. Thank you. We uh, seem to have enough time for maybe a couple of questions. So, do we have some questions from anyone? Oh, oh, I do have one. Sorry. Oh, well, People always have questions about the brain, so don't be shy. This is the time to ask. Do we know why the brain is organized into two rather weakly connected hemispheres? There are. Maybe you could repeat that. Cause yeah, so the question is, do we, do we know why the brain is organized in two hemispheres that are only loosely connected? You know, you can actually live with only one hemisphere. There are a lot of theories. Yeah, people have looked at that in the detail. The two are not symmetric. The right hemisphere is actually much longer and elongated. That You probably could see that of Fred Bob here. Um, yes, uh, and it's this idea, again, of specialization that part of the architecture allows you to process things separately and then connect the information after the fact. It's again that you can, it, rather than taking the whole information, you can compartmentalize between the two. And people have argued that it's, it's a very important feature of our evolution of cognitive function, that separation. Uh, but do we know? Yeah, probably the answer is no, we don't really know. But yes, people have looked at that in detail. It's very important, I think, very important. And there are a lot of diseases that are related to, you know, this, the junction is very thin, the corpus callosum. This, uh, this is gray matter. And when, if you lose that, then there are a lot of uh, problems that you start having, and, you know, uh, uh, functional and psychological problems related to that. So um, uh, it is important. It's very fragile. So. Okay, okay well, one last question I think we'll have time for. If you have a question after, please don't, do come and ask me in person. I'd be happy to uh, why is the power of a brain affected by the size of the animal? Why would a one kilogram brain in a mouse make it a genius mouse, but a one kilogram brain in a blue whale make it a moron whale? So that's a, a very good question. So why, if you take the elephant, for instance, the elephant has more uh, neurons than the, uh, that the human brain. Not only it's bigger, but if you count the neurons, it's more. So uh, one of the ideas is that it's related to the amount of connection that you need to the rest of the brain. If you need for sensory motion and control a certain density of axons per unit length, then you need to integrate all that. And again, it's a theory. Uh, but it has been advanced that, for instance, for the reason why there are more uh, neurons in the cerebellum of the elephant than in, in human is the, is the intricate nervation of the elephant trunk that needs a lot of control and sensory feedback. Okay. So, why? <laughs> yes, it's a good question. You know, would a small person be not as good as a big person because they have a smaller brain, or so on? So there was a discussion, a funny discussion in the 19th century, and people in France started measuring and doing teas, and then they realized that the brain of Germans were actually bigger than the brain, the brain of France. So they were not very happy with that. I say, wait a second, wait a second. The Germans are taller than we are, so that's why we have to scale that proportionally. At the same time, they already had proof scientifically that men were smarter than women because they had bigger brain, but they never applied the same scaling between men and women, of course. They only applied for between, between the French and German. <laughs> so yes, so scaling, the ideas around scaling, it's not quite clear. That I think scaling is more interesting to see, understand the type of architecture that you can have at different size, right? Because you take a given architecture, you have different physical constraints, so if you want to make it 10 times bigger, you cannot just multiply everything by 10. You have to start changing things, and that's why it's important. So for instance, the lower mammals are not, do not have this convolution, do not have that at all. They're all smooth brain. And that's purely because they are not allowed, because of the scaling, they're not able to develop this circonvolution. 
The ferret is the smallest mammal that has this. Mouse is, is the, the... And then there is the, the mystery of the manatees. Manatees are very big. They have a smooth brain. Nobody knows why. Why don't they follow? They're outside the curve also, the other one. So it's a good mystery. Okay, I, I think we don't have time enough uh, for, for more. So before we thank our speakers again, can I just point out a couple of things? There's a um, feedback form, if you could fill that in, please. And there's a box outside uh, in the hallway where you can just slip it in. It'd be great if you could fill that in so we can know, know how to make these uh, talks even, even better than they are. Uh, before we finish, I'd like to thank uh, the London Maths Society staff who've uh, been helping out uh, in, the, in the evening, doing all sorts of different things. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Institute of Education staff. I don't know where they are, but um, we'll thank them anyway. And, of course, I'd like to thank you. Thank you all for coming out on an evening and having uh, and, and uh, participating, asking questions. Um, it's good to see you all. So, um, one last set of people to, to thank. We'll thank the speakers again by uh, giving a round of applause. Thank you.